about the last six months, and uh, it's a great worship and praise song. Amen? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Every bit of it. Praise the Lord. We're in our series on no regrets. Uh, I wish I could tell you there were absolutely none, but every once in a while you have one. But it should be uh, that we can look for the promise of raising our kids. And as the Bible says, training our children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. If you're the first time to be here in several weeks, then don't know that this is, a, you should know that we're in the middle of a, a series of messages that ends this month on no regret parenting. And what we're dealing with today is a, a specific issue. Next week, by the way, we're going to be talking about uh, hope for hurting parents. I think I uh, said last Sunday, I'd be preaching on this Sunday, but I corrected it in the e-blast that I sent out. So if you get the e-blast, you'll, you'll see the correction in there that I was going to hold it for the last Sunday in the series. Same time, uh, if you're not getting the e-blast, you need to get signed up for it so you can kind of keep up kind of week to week, last word, those kind of things that happen uh, and talk about sometimes current events that are going on or give you an encouraging word about something. Biggest encouraging word to remember right now more than any other word is that uh, you have a civic responsibility called vote. Vote, 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 vote. So I uh, hope you're registered. Early voting starts Monday in most counties in Texas. So uh, I believe all the counties in Texas early voting starts. So if you don't like a line, go vote early. Uh, and as the Democrats say, vote early, vote often. No, it's just a joke. Okay, forget it. But <laughs> I've heard it the other way too, so just get over it. But it is important that we do let our voice be heard and that we do stand for biblical standards. We promote biblical values and biblical character. Uh, I only know of one person who's running on some of those standards, so uh, obviously you know who that is. The person I'll personally be voting for. We don't as a church endorse anybody, but I personally can endorse whoever I want to. Ha ha. <laughs> Just as you can as well. I, I will be casting my vote for Mitt Romney, not because I'm a Mormon supporter, but because he is the closest to my biblical convictions about what a marriage is between a man and a woman, what the standards are for government and life and the role of the people, what the responsibilities we are in regard to uh, abortion and pro-life. There's just so many issues that we can talk about. Maybe next Sunday I'll, I'll mention a few more, but that'll get you started. You say, well, I vote this party, I vote that party. I vote only one party, and that's the Holy Ghost party. Amen. I just believe that we as Christians are obligated. <laughs> We're obligated above forums and platforms and parties to the Bible and to the Word of God. And so let's, let's find out what the Bible says and let's vote our convictions based upon Scripture and what does the Bible teach us and where do we go. That way uh, you're, not, you're not bound to anything but Jesus Christ. Amen? And teach your children those things as well. In fact, that's where we're going. We're going to be talking about this particular one item today called character. What is it? Amen? Well, a simple definition we'll reiterate several times is living by a right standard. We talked about in one of our messages, in fact, the first message within the series, we dealt with this issue of having a standard in raising children. And sometimes our standards are not what they ought to be. They may look good and they may sound good. I mean, we measure by standards, by the way. And if you're measuring by the wrong standards, you may not get what you want. So find out the right standard, which is the Word of God. The goal, I believe, is to raise spiritual children, pe people who are going to grow up, love Jesus with all their heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. That's the goal of, of parenting for our children. And to do that, you have to use the right standard. If your standard is based upon kind of... Uh, uh, the world standards, and the world standards go something like this. If they don't smoke, if they don't go to jail, if they don't do drugs, if they're not involved with promiscuous lifestyles, if they're not parts of gangs, and we list all that stuff. Well, those are all pretty noble things. I don't want my kid going to jail, doing drugs, and, you know, all that stuff. <clears throat> but the standard really is, is holiness unto the Lord. The standard is, is what does God desire for our children, that God has a plan and a purpose for their life. And guess what? Make it simple for you. It's the same one as it is for your life. God designed that you be created, then recreated in Christ Jesus, to be transformed into the image of His dear Son, the Lord Jesus, the Scripture tells. In other words, we're to be like Christ. That our life and, and, and our life goal is Christ. That Christ be seen in our life, be manifest in our life, in every part of our life. And that's where we should be focusing on as parents. But unfortunately, we've, we've, uh, we're not raising that standard today. We're raising some moral standards, perhaps, as parents, but we've got to go to the Bible and find out what the Scriptures teach and what are the spiritual standards. I was going to show you some polls and stuff today, but I had the guys delete some of those slides earlier on today. And, uh, but let me just say this a, a little bit to show you that uh, 
I don't think we're meeting the biblical criteria in raising children today. Josh McDowell is a very popular author and very popular conference speaker, especially among young people, written many books. He did a survey of students. In fact, 4,000 students were involved in this survey, and this was over a decade ago, uh, mid-90s, I believe it was. And as he traveled across the country and doing all these conference seminars with young people, they uh, gave a questionnaire of 193 questions out to about 4,000 students who ranged from the ages of 11 to 18 years of age. And these were in, in the context of Christian conferences. Uh, more than 80% of those who were surveyed, this, of the 4,000, more than 80% of these students said they, they attended an evangelical church weekly. 86%, vast majority, said that they knew the Lord, that they were born-again believers and, and, and saved Christians, all right? But as he got back the answers to the 193 questions, it was quite boggling because they discovered in, with this survey that our children are not adapting, or adopting, excuse me, the value system of the evangelical church, or at least the church ought to have. In fact, they realized that m many young people at all were not, uh, were not embracing their parents' uh, biblical convictions or their standards. 66% said that they uh, would lie to their parents on, you know, at least, uh, you know, once a quarter, you know, <laughs> they lied to their parents. 59, almost 60% say they lied to their friends and peers. 45% said that they, you know, watched things uh, regularly that were not godly. 55% said that most of them lived in confusion. Half of them said they lived stressed out lives. 46% of them said they're always tired. Filled with many other amazing statistics that said many, many were cheating, regularly smoking, gambling, watching porn or X-rated movies, engaged in premarital sex. And this was just, you know, all across the board. And we're losing a generation of children. And I believe we've lost the last generation before this generation of children because they're not learning about this particular biblical principle about what character is. And ultimately, the ultimate character is to be more like Christ and to be like Jesus and to exemplify Him in every part of our life. But we're living in a culture that doesn't know anything about character because it's missing that all-important word and that, that last word in the sentence on the screen, which is standard. We don't have a standard. Society has no standard. It, it moves. It, 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 remember the series I did on homosexuality, that, that sermon in that series? We said in the 1970s, early 70s, that homosexuality was, was considered to be a, a mental disease, a moral disease, a perversion of sexual behavior, and how that has changed in a couple of decades. In fact, about a decade later, it was completely something different in the minds of our culture, just another alternative lifestyle. And it's the same all the way across the board. We're seeing the standards are shifting as far as the world is concerned. But we, we, we must understand about God, His standards never change. He is always the same. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. For all time and all eternity, God has never changed. That's where you use that theological term, immutable. I am the Lord. I change not. So what God has been for, He's always been for. And what God is against, guess what? He's always been against that. So if we're going to learn what character is, we have to embrace the proper standard and embrace the Lord and embrace the Word and, and believe that here's the kind of value system that means something. Here's a value system that will mean something in eternity. That's what I want to teach my children. That's what we want to teach our grandchildren. So we come back to this important principle of character. It's always interesting that uh, up, even up until recent years, character, especially at the time of elections became a, uh, an important word. And people argue over character, and is character important, those things. It seems like even the last four, five, six years, that word hasn't become part of the, the scene anymore. It's not, it's not relevant anymore. People don't want to talk about character because we've decided in our culture that character is not important. But if you study the scriptures, you'll see that character is extremely important and that it is measurable and it is set upon standards that are set and fixed. To have character literally means I will live by a standard, but not just any old standard. I will live by the highest standard. And we know, as we'll talk about even later on, that's the Word of God. That's the character of the Lord Jesus, the, the character of the triune God, that He's holy, He's unique, and God wants us to be that same way. Now, if let me say that as parents, if we're going to embrace this kind of mindset and, and, and say character is valuable and it is important, then it does require some action on our parts. Character doesn't come built in to our children any more than it came built into us. It has to be learned and discerned and achieved and, 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 and moved on. And it requires one action as a parent, and it also requires conviction on your part. In other words, you can't, you can't follow 
the popular idea of culture, you have to always be embracing what does the Bible say? And what does the Bible say to me? And that concerns issues with my children and to their behavior and to, to relationships and to their friendships and to their habits, to the things they'll watch, they'll read, they'll see. I want to impart convictions unto them, all right? But for you to impart convictions, guess what? You have to have some. You have to have convictions. You say, well, I don't have any. Well, borrow mine until you get some, all right? Because I've got a lot of them. <laughs> I've got plenty to share. Now, I like to share my convictions because they're not necessarily my convictions. These are things that are obviously stated from the Word of God. So what does God say about our culture? What does God say about relationship? What does God say about money? What does God say about friends? What does God say about dating? What does God say about marriage? Everything is in the Word of God. So we have to be concerned with reputation. There's an ex-basketball coach named John Wooden who was coach for the UCLA Bruins basketball team. made this great statement. Be more concerned with your character than your reputation. Your character is what you really are. While your reputation is merely what others think you are. And most people are not concerned about character. They are concerned about what other people think about them. What their reputation is. But character goes much deeper than reputation. Character is foundational to your life if you're going to enjoy your life and experience fullness in life. I love what D.L. Moody says. You know what character is? Character is what you are in the dark. When nobody's watching, when parents aren't around, when boss is not around, when spouse is not around, how's your behavior? How are your actions? How are your attitudes at that point? Now, I'm going to share with you an outline today of kind of a three point, but you know me, I'll have a few sub points under that. But the three most important elements, I believe, that best exemplify character that we want to pour into the life of our children. And these are important. And each one of these is a point of my message today. Respect. And you can even say it a little better, that respect for authority. Number two is honor. And number three is honesty. Anything I want to teach my children, I want to be sure I incorporate these three things into their hearts and these three things into their life. Parents, you need to write those three things down on your own forehead so you don't forget them. And those are the things that you not only need to speak to them, they're the things that you need to live before them. They're the things that you need to exemplify by your life before them. Simply respect, honor, honesty. How important are these? Well, let's just look at them individually, and let me make it a little more clear. First is respect for authority. Let's look at the scripture. In Romans chapter 1, it gives us a clear idea of what God has to say about authority. All right? And by the way, this is the hardest of the three lessons to learn. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whoever therefore resists the power resists the ordinance of God. Consequently... By the way, there are consequences. If you rebel against authority, it's, 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 then you're rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will only bring judgment on themselves. And then he goes on to say, and these are important, these bring them all together. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right. It's for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from, from the fear of the one in authority? Just do what's right. He'll commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath, to bring punishment on wrongdoers. Therefore, it's necessary to submit to authorities. Let me say it again. It's necessary to submit to authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. By the way, parents, if you want to do a good study with your children and a little Bible study with them, just start looking up all the verses, get your concordance out, and look up conscience and clear conscience and what the Bible has to say about our, our conscience. A lot of parents say, well, you know, I want my kids to have, you know, have, a, have, have confidence in life and I want them to feel secure in life. Well, you'll see that those things are the byproduct of living with a clear conscience in their life and the importance of a clear conscience that they can be transparent before God. And I'll talk about that in a moment, but it's important. In verses 2 and verses 5, he just reiterates the fact of what authority is there for. He said it's for our protection. It's there to, to help us. It's there to, 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 rain, to, to be there as a guideline and guidepost and fences for us. But if you rebel against that, he says, you're rebelling against God. God has established authority. In verse 5, he went on to talk about how the fact that it's necessary to submit to authorities. It's important. It's, it's, it's necessary. One, two, two reasons. One, because if you do what's wrong and you re 
resist the authority, there's a price to pay for that. It's like in traffic. This morning when I pulled out on, on the road going to the Magnolia campus, pulled out right behind me. Uh, I noticed in my rearview mirror was a, a constable from Precinct 4. Pulled out right behind me. He wasn't pulling me over anything, but it's a clear reminder <laughs> that I need to do the speed limit and my seatbelt ought to be buckled. And if he continues to follow, I might even check my inspection sticker <laughs> just to make sure. But not, I'm not afraid of him. All right, unless I'm doing wrong. Yeah. And if I'm doing right, then I, I welcome him. Because some idiot might pull out in front of me. I didn't use that word, all right? Some bad person. <laughs> I've been with a grandchild this weekend, all right? I'm trying to get over my bad words. So some bad person, may, and he'll see it. Or someone might try to rob me. He's there. He's nearby. I, later on, it, on the trip over here, I pulled up by a Tom Ball police officer on the side of his bumper in big letters, protect and serve. That's what it's there for. What am I afraid of? Nothing if I'm doing what's right. Are you with me on this? Yeah. The Bible goes on to say you need to understand authority is, first of all, who's the authority over all authorities? The number one authority is God. God. And it all flows down from Him. And just as God is there to protect me, minister to me, meet my life needs, be my heavenly Father, He says all authority functions if it's proper authority in those kind of ways. But we need to learn how to respond to authority. And it's so important to teach this to your children, what authority is all about, and how that you're an authority over their life, all right? That God has given you to be an authority over their life to protect them, and to help them, and to strengthen them, and to provide for them, and to love them, that you are there for a reason, but you teach them that with all authorities. Now, unfortunately, our children are born sinners. A few of you are saying amen. You know they're little sinners, all right? I mean, it doesn't take long to find out they're little sinners, does it? I mean, they're as cute as they can be when you hold them in the hospital and they're just looking up and they're all, you know, pink and colored and you know, whatever it might be, you know. They're just kind of grinning at you and they don't know anything about anything, but they do know how to sin. Doesn't take them long. No lessons have to be given on being selfish. They just pick it up. You know, they don't have to learn how to lie. They just do it. They don't have to, they don't have to, they don't have to learn how to take stuff. They just do it. It's natural, but they're just like you. So when people say they look just like you, I think they mean more than what they're saying. <laughs> they look like you in a lot of ways, all right? So as we said about it requires action, teaching this does, means that you also have to be submitted to authority in your life. And I want my children to grow up with a submissive heart towards God, so what do I demonstrate? I demonstrate a submissive heart towards God, and what do I teach? Then I can teach a submissive heart to God. But this is, this is, this is priority number one. God is above all things. Jesus is Lord. He's ahead of all things. He is the ultimate authority. And it's within our nature to say no to God. It's within our nature to rebel against God. And so we have to be instructed. We have to be given the word of God. Do you realize just for a moment what the world would be like if there were no authority? The chaos that would reign and rule? I think sometimes the chaos that rules in homes is because people aren't responding to the biblical authority of Jesus as Lord over a family, a husband in a relationship over a wife. They just reject the children out of, out of control and not being submissive to their parents. And just, it's just chaos. So I want to teach our children that there is an order that God has given us, and it's an important order that God has called to. And one thing about authority is this. It really reveals my heart and the character of my heart. Am I a stubborn person or am I a humble person? Am I, am I, am I that kind of person who resists authority who under, or a person who understands authority? Submission to authority, folks, is more, though, than just an outward act of compliance. It really is an attitude that I could do in my heart what I'm doing with my life. That I don't act one way, but yet in my heart I'm really being another way. I don't pretend submission and then just go off behind the scenes and in the dark, as D.L. Moody said, and just be a different way. It's something that I am living in my, within, not just without. You've heard me use illustration about the parent who tells the little boy to go sit in the corner. And he goes and he sits in the corner, but in his mind he's thinking, hey, I may be sitting here, but I'm standing in my heart. I mean, we talked about the, the different types of rebellion last week, the, the active and the passive kind of rebellion. It has to be on both sides of this, that my heart as well as my actions are, have this compliance to the will of God and to the heart of God. And if I don't, 
Man, I tell you, I, I started listing about six or seven verses, and I could have listed many, many more about the importance of teaching this to your children and what will happen to children if you're a young person here today, a child here today, a teenager here today, listen carefully to what the Bible says about children who don't learn this lesson. And it has to be taught by parents, obviously, but Exodus 21 says it very clearly. He that smites his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Caution is the sign here. Careful how you treat your parents. Careful how you respond to them. Not only in action, but in your heart. I just wish they were dead. <laughs> I just wish they lew out. And all those, that, ver two verses later, it says, And he that curses, which means to lightly esteem or to trifle with someone, curses his father's mother shall surely be put to death. You just disregard what they're saying to me. Or you pretend to be obedient to them. Exodus 20, verse 12, a couple chapters, uh, a chapter before that in verse 12, says, Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God gives thee. Boy, there's a pretty clear uh, uh, difference in the, uh, of what happens. Uh, it's death, it's misery, it's pain versus being blessed and succeeding and being prospered by the hand of God. Wh which one do you want here? Uh, Jesus speaks in Matthew five, uh, 15, verse 4, and he says, For... God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he that, in referencing the verse we just read, and he that curses or speaks evil of his father and mother, let him die the death. Paul reiterated this same promise in Ephesians 6 when he said, Honor your mother and your father, which is the first commandment with a promise. Pretty important phrasing here of what he's telling us to do. You honor them, or you're going to trifle them, you're going to rebel against them, you're going to speak of them, you're going to act in disregard to them. God says, hey, it's blessing or it's cursed. How do you want it in life? You say, well, I'll get away with it. You don't get away with anything. Proverbs 30, verse 17 puts it this way. The eye that mocks his father or despises to his, obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out and the young eagles shall eat it. Well, that's, that's promising. You ever see a, an animal on the side of the road, the vultures, and they, they gather around it? First, most, most likely what they begin to chew on will be the eyes. A raven will pluck out an eye of an injured animal. Why? One, it can't respond to you. And number two, if it makes sure it is dead, if it's, if it's not dead, when he picks at the eye, you're going to know it's not dead. So they'll, they, they do this, but there's a spiritual application here and a spiritual principle that talks about disobedience the Bible's referred to in scriptures as that fowl that of the air, that bird of the air that is like this predatory animal that wants to destroy you. He wants to steal the word of God from you. He wants to blind you. He wants to take away and, uh, truth and shield you from the truth. He wants to shield you from character. He doesn't want you knowing what's right and knowing what's wrong. And I think the principle in, in the New Testament, the Old Testament, obviously you could take a rebellious child to the high priest or to the priestly officials the idea here is that, hey, young people, get your heart right with God. Don't be disobedient to your parents. Learn how to submit to authority so you can clearly see directions in your life and clearly see the paths that you really want to go in life and not be deceived to fall into constant traps throughout your life. It's important that we learn this principle of honoring. Now, the principle here in the Old Testament is I have a rebellious son. I could take him to the priest and they'd stone him. Uh, I'll just put it this way. If you have a child that's not obeying, bring him up here. We'll throw rocks at him. Some of you like that, no? For a moment. Talk through the first. We won't throw rocks at him. But what we will do, you can bring him to a youth worker. You can bring him to a, pa a pastor. We've had parents before say, I've got that point. I just don't know what's next. Bring him on up here. We'll have a little sit-down chat with you too. And we'll just simply talk about some of these verses and what the Bible has to say. And why it's important that you as a young person or as a child should, should submit to your parent. And how that if you're not, you're just paving the road for misery throughout the rest of your life. You're going to make yourself miserable. That's not what you want. That's not what God wants. That's not God's will. Now, obviously, we said, what does God want for our lives? God wants us to be holy, to be like Jesus, to be that unique child of God. When you look at Leviticus 20, the Lord is saying, Leviticus, be ye holy. And then through Leviticus, he begins to give us some biblical principles on how we can be holy. In fact, in verse 9, two verses after this, he says, all right, if you curse your mother and your father, you'd be put to the death. In other words, that's not holy. That's not the way to live. That's the arrogance of your mind, pride, you know, self-righteousness, self-seeking, self-grandizement. Those things are not holy. They're not going to honor God, and you're just putting yourself into more pain and to more misery upon your own life. 
Now, I love in Ephesians when it says it twice, it puts it this way about child relationships and parent relationship. One, six, one says, children, obey your parents. Second verse says, children, honor your parents. And this commandment comes both ways. One time it's very clear in Exodus, you, you obey your parents. In other places, it's really children, you honor your parents. To obey them comes, comes to us first in Ephesians 6 because that's the first part of your relationship to a parent. That's the first part a parent has to teach his children. You are responsible for obeying me. This is a, not just my idea. This is a godly order. This is the way God set it up. This is what the Bible teaches, that I'm your parent. I'm over you. In fact, the word hupakao has to do with something, bringing something under something. Lining something up literally means to line something up out of obligation or out of duty. And what does the Bible say? We have an obligation to obey those that are over us to submit to authority. Romans says, because authority comes from God. God structured your family the way he structured it for a reason. He gives us the biblical guidelines for a reason. And if we can embrace that reason and realize that God is involved and God is concerned and God's ways are not my ways, but God's ways are righteous ways and to submit to those ways, it's amazing what God can do in your life. I want my children to learn this principle growing up because I knew if they could learn this principle growing up, there's no end to where they could go in life. What employer is not just begging to find somebody who understands the principle of obedience? This is why a lot of employers look to, to hire people out of the military, who people who've been in the military for a while, because they've learned some simple principles about authority, at least should have learned them, amen? That there's lines of authority. And if we operate within those contexts and within those lines, there's victory and there's blessing. But it's a, it's a, it's a priority principle. Teach them. Obedience to your parents is priority number one in your spiritual life. There are four facets that, that deal with genuine obedience. Now, if you've been in the youth group very long, you should know these by memory. If you don't know them by memory when I start on them, I'm going to flog you after church. No. <laughs> that was a joke for you on camera there, okay? These are things, I talk about them in our youth retreats. We go there annually, I go over these. I've talked about them in different venues. We've talked about these things in church uh, and, and services. These are the four elements of obedience. The parents ought to be the ones who know them. Amen? Maybe we should flog them instead. Can I get an amen? But what are they? Write these down. These are, these are the things that I want my children to know. You want your children to know when you say obey me, this is what it means. Are you ready? Some of you are not ready. You can get your pencil out, get your smartphone out, whatever it takes. Take a picture. Do something. Take a picture of the PowerPoint. I don't know what it means, but whatever it means, you'll have these handy. You say, when I teach my children to obey, here's what I'm trying to say. If I say do this, here's what I mean. Four points. Number one, it's pretty simple. Do it without complaint. Yeah. Quit your whining. Put your big boy pants on. Quit whining. No murmuring. No under my breath. No behind the scenes. If it's really obedience, it's just done. This is the way God wants me to learn obedience. I'm not murmuring when he tells me to do something. Second of all, I want my children to understand it's without challenge. And you can challenge with attitudes. You can challenge with words. Sometimes it's just with your eyes. You roll those eyes up in your head. Well, I tell you, that's one thing. My mama's here today. She taught me what obedience was the hard way. <laughs> because I was stubborn. All right? But we all are born that way. We have to learn this principle. So if you have a child who likes to roll their eyes, you need to set them down and say, now from, day, from now on, it's not a second chance, a third chance, a fourth time. From now on, from this point on, when I say obey me in this regard, here's the four things that daddy means or mommy means. And if you don't do these, there's some parameters, there's some boundaries that you're crossing, and there's going to be a price to pay for it. It might, it might be your iPod, it might be your phone, it might be the computer, it might be going to the bathroom like I talked about last week. Whatever it might be, you, it, there's a price to pay for this, I mean, depending you know, on, on the crime, depending on what the time is. But it's without challenge. The third point is, and it means to be done all the way, complete. And Mama says clean the room. What does that mean? It means you clean the room not according to your standard of clean. Because your standard of clean means most of the stuff is hidden and under the bed shoved up in the drawers, pushed back in the closets, and the doors closets are closed. But they're waiting to explode. No, what does it mean? And parents, it may mean you have to take some time here and go sit in the room and give coaching lessons for one time of what it means. Don't do it two times, don't do it three times, just after that. They don't do it after that. 
it's okay, I'm sorry. This, I told you what was going to come. It's going to come. And we talked about the consistency last week. And the fourth part is this. Immediately. Not next week, not next month. to go do it now. But I'm watching TV. Now. Now. And some of you are blessed in your home to have DVR, so it's not a real big sacrifice there, is it? <laughs> do it now. Well, I don't want to do it now. You're going to do it now. You're going to do it now. Here's what happens. I think I'll do it now. It's amazing how now can come when you know what the, what the ramifications are. As he said, you know, in Romans 13, you know, you understand the punishment thereof, but you also know the blessings thereof or the consequences one way or the other. I prefer blessings over cursings, you know. I, I prefer a pat on the head than one on the backside. Can I get a witness? Amen. But a parent has to teach these things. And it comes by you taking the time and the discipline as a person, as a parent, to do so. Then there's the, the Word of God, which the Bible says we talk, up, talk about submitting to all authority that God's given us. Literally, if we're going to do that in the way the Word of God gives it to us, it has to do with devotion. I, I need to learn devotion to God. I need to learn the devotion to His Word, and even to my parents. There's a devotion that takes place. So the first word has to do with respect for authority. The second principle I want my children to learn is, is the element of, of, of this character, of, 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 is, is this part of honor. And now, a lot of people think about it in the context of honor and obey. We just mentioned children honor your parents and obey your parents, but they are different. The word honor is, is a unique word in Scripture. It means to give something to value, to estimate value, or to fix values to something. You know, that somebody holds it as valuable. It may not hold value in a monetary realm to the rest of the world, but it means something that you placed, placed a price on. All right? The world doesn't place a very big premium on fathers or mothers, you know. They, it's nice to have a parent or two parents, whatever, but God does. God, God places a high premium on your parents. And so you need to do so as well. But it's something that basically that you say, I will choose to value this. I, I've used the illustration before, but it's so appropriate, I'll use it again. And, and I remember when my, when my wife's uh, uh, dad passed away. And a couple of the items, you know, that, that, that she wanted from the house, you know, uh, that she just said it reminded her of dad. If she wanted, he was a welder and he always you know, had those little funky looking caps with a little lid on them, you know, brim on them. And he had some bandanas he'd wear when he was working. She got a couple of those things and she got one of his three ties, man after my own heart. <laughs> and she wanted one of those ties and she wanted this old beat up, you know, $9 when it was probably new Timex watch. That's all she wanted. And she has those things today. And she affixed great value. If I were to have a garage sale tomorrow and put them in a garage sale, I'd lose my life, first of all. <laughs> but two, you know, anybody coming there and say, well, I might give you a nickel for that watch, just because the band's probably still good. No value whatsoever, but it is priceless to her. It's valuable to her. It means something to her. And this is the, the idea of what this word honor means. It means to affix value to something. And you need to realize as young people, as children, how valuable your parents are. They love you. They provide for you. They protect you. They feed you. They house you. They, they clothe you. They take care of you constantly. They're concerned. They pray for you. They're always, always concerned about you. There's not a day goes by in the thoughts of their life and mind that are not filled with you most of the time. That, that's a blessing from God. Because there are a lot of children out there who don't have that blessing of God. So you need to take the time to value and to honor them, to revere, is what one passage has to say, to strongly devote your heart to him, to your parents. But one of the great sins of our age and this generation is to just dishonor parents. Just milk them for what you can get out of them, take advantage of them, and just do what you want to do. In fact, we just see today children just seem to be uh, no longer... Uh, understanding this principle. Children, obey your parents. Children, you honor parents. Those are two words in Scripture. Now, when does the obedience part end? Well, when you step out of that house and you start your own life and you have a marriage and you have a family, that, that, that obedience part, you know, you, you, you don't have to obey them, all right? My mama tells me to take out the trash. She comes over my house to me and says, I don't have to do it. No, it's my house, my trash. <laughs> nah, 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 nah. I had to when I was a yeah. But you know what? I'll take it out anyway. Because I honor her. You understand the difference? And the Bible says, children, honor your parents. And that goes on for the rest of your life. All right? I don't live there, and I don't reside there. And she's not giving me orders anymore. 
all right? And giving me instruction like that anymore, what to do. She's always continuing to fill me with biblical principles. But I have, a, I have this thing God's given me called my mom that I'll, I'll honor her even after she's gone, you know? So we'll have a good time in heaven in eternity, amen? The idea here is that God's giving you to say, well, 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 just what is honor? Let me teach you this, what you want to teach your children about honor. You know, it, it's deep respect. And real love flows out of that deep respect. And that's what you need to learn to embrace as a child. And there's several things that, that you know, honor is based on. Four things like I did with obedience. One is based on time. The more you know them, the more you live in that house, the more you understand, the more time you take on understanding, the more you're going to understand what it means to honor them. Also based on knowledge. You know, you should know, you should be aware how much your parents love you. You should be aware how much they care for you. Even though they might not demonstrate that love the way you like it demonstrated all the time, they still continue to show themselves as people that love you. They've forgiven you, they've received you, they've blessed you, they've given you. You should know through, through time and knowledge, but also through experience. You have seen their love demonstrated through their sacrifices. It doesn't take long if you'll just sit down as a young person and look through the through the the, the 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 life the short life you've had and you'll see how much your parents have demonstrated and have sacrificed so that you could have stuff and acceptance and love and also I think appreciation there should be appreciation that's part of honor an, ex, uh, an expression of appreciation to them that they because they've loved you in the way they have honor is so lost and I know some kids sit around, well, my parents, you know, I don't think they don't understand me. They don't, my parents are, what if, what if my parents are jerks, all right? What if my parents are jerks? Uh, uh, Richard Bateman sitting over here, he was part of our youth ministries years and years ago, and he probably remembered making the same statement back then. What do you do when your parents are jerks? Because I have not changed a very this, because sometimes parents can be jerks. I told you they were just like you, all right? What do you do if they're jerks? The Bible says love your neighbors, you love yourself. You always love them. You continue to love them, and you continue to do what God says. Because there is the highest authority. And God says, children, obey your parents. God says, children, honor your parents. God says, love your neighbor as yourself. So that's just something you do as, because you're a believer, because you believe the Bible, because you believe God. You do what God says. I have a, I have a stepdaddy, you know, and I don't like him, and he's my stepfather, and I don't do what he says. Listen, Jesus was raised with a stepfather. And he responded in obedience, and he responded in honor to the parent that God had placed over his life. Jesus respected and Jesus revered. Proverbs 30, remember, let's go back to that verse. What happens to the person who, does, who mocks the father, despised the way of mother? The ravens of the valley. In fact, the Hebrew word for mock there is a, is a word which means to ridicule. Don't be laughing at your parents behind their back. Don't be ridiculing them. You know? What happens in your eyes are plucked out? No ability to see. The greatest disarming thing in anybody's life, that's why they plucked Samson's eyes out, so he couldn't see to do anything. It's a way of disarming you, taking away your ability to, to stand, taking away your ability to fight. And Satan's aim is to blind you. The Bible says the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers, lest they should see the light of the glorious gospel in the face of Jesus Christ. He wants to blind you. He doesn't want you to see the importance of respect for authority. He doesn't want you to see the importance of honoring your parents. Well, I mean, just as a young person, what are some ways you could honor your parents? This, just watch and, and listen to God. I mean, when's the last time you sat down and told them how much you loved them, how much you were, you were blessed by their sacrifices, how much you were, thank God for the time they pour into your life? You want them to remember your birthday. Do you remember theirs? How about their anniversaries? How about special days? What about you that are not at home anymore, but are you still honoring your parents? Do you remember those? Do you pick up the phone? Do you make a call? Do you send an email, a text, or anything? Listen, it's important that you continue to honor your parents even when you're out of home because your children will most likely treat you the same way that you treated your parents. And if you show honor and respect for your parents, it's amazing how that will continue into the next generation. What I want my children to know, respect for authority. I want them to know honor, but the third element that I want them to know, obviously, is honesty. You know, we're living in an instant society and an instant culture, and this is a hard thing because everybody wants it now, and everybody wants it fast, and everybody wants gratification instantly, all right? So this is where you say, well, how does that play into the whole idea of honesty? If, if, if this is the instant culture that we live in, everybody wants it now, wants it, wants, it, wants it without paying for it. Hey, you get into issues like lying. You get issues like cheating. I just cheat. If I cheat on the test, I don't have to study. I can get something interesting. If I just lie, I can have what I want now, or I can get out of something. Basically, you have no character. There's, there's no standards in your life. And what you become is just a liar and a cheater. By the way, isn't that common sense? 
If you lie, you're a liar. If you cheat, you're a thief. You, if you steal stuff, you're a thief. Is, is that what you want to be said of your life? That's why kids get involved in premarital sexual relationships. You know, I have these hormones going on in my body. I just want to satisfy, and I want what I want, and I want it now. And you disregard what the Bible has to say about marriage and, and family and honor and integrity and character and purity. That's why so many couples are so concerned. There's a great deal of guilt that comes in when you start living outside these, these, these areas of honesty and you begin to live a dishonest life. Then that guilt comes and, and then that uh, insecurity comes and fear comes, lack of trust. It's, I, I can't tell you many couples I've dealt with over the years who, who come in with a lack of trust in their marriage relationship. And I've gone back and I've asked them, hey, let me just ask you a very personal question. Were you and guys involved sexually before you were married? And you'd be surprised. I mean, say yes. And they're still struggling because they just didn't take to heart what God said then. And I want you to know, gentlemen, young guys, you listen to me. You may think you're, ball on the, you're just all on the same page and you're all in agreement about this relationship and where it's going to go, but I want you to know God expects you to be a leader, young man. And if you'll lead your wife into the valleys of sin, where are you going to lead her I mean, before she's your wife? What's going to happen after she's your wife? Are you going to show integrity now? Or are you going to show trustworthiness now? In other words, in her mind, she may be thinking, hey, I did that, but if he violates God's word now, what's going to happen after we're married, can I trust him then? Why, what, is he going to violate the part about, he violated the part about fornication? Is he going to violate the part about adultery? All this, all this breeds more mistrust and breeds more guilt and more fear into, into, into the hearts and the lives of people who choose to live this kind of way. So I talk about this instant culture and how it fights against having an honest heart and an honest spirit. Well, if there's things in your life, young people, that you'll share with your friends, but you won't tell your parents about, you need to get your heart right. Your friends don't care about you like your parents do. They may love you, they may encourage you, but they do not care about your future the way your parents do. And they will most likely not give you the answers you need. Well, if I tell my parents I'll get in trouble, that's okay. All right, go ahead and get in trouble. It's better to have a little short-time trouble than a lifetime of misery making one foolish mistake after another foolish mistake because your friends who don't know any better said it was all right. I would encourage you as young people, if you have secrets and dark areas of your life you're ashamed of or afraid of, you sit down with your mom and your dad and say, listen, I did this, I know this is where I've been going, this is what I've been doing, this is how I've been behaving. I don't want to live like this. I need your help. Amen. You might be surprised what God would do. It takes honesty. Don't you want to teach your children honesty? And how important honesty is. But you have to be honest. You know, you, you, the telephone rings and you see who it is on caller ID. You can't tell your children, oh, tell them I'm not here. Well, you big fat liar. What kind of lesson is that? It's not a lesson we want our kids to learn, is it? We have to model these things as well as we speak this time. You say, well, okay, well, what's the big thing? What's honesty? You know, what am I going to get at? Hey, you got to have some standards, first of all. And you're going to have to embrace the right standards and not the right standards. If you can embrace the right standards, which are the highest standards, which is God's standards, then guess what? The character begins to be built and developed in your life, and which is far more important than your reputation. Amen? But honesty, let me just give you about six, seven, eight things real quick, just one-liners, all right? Here's what honesty will get you. If you want to tell your kids when you're talking about honesty, why should I be honest? One, because it does protect you from guilt. There's nothing more wrenching in your gut than guilt. God made you that way, so that when you do wrong, you know it. All right? Guilt. It's a good thing from God, but you need to teach your kids about it. Obviously, honesty provides for a clear conscience, and I talked about that, what it means to have a clear conscience. There's security, there's confidence, there's freedom, there's trust. So many benefits to having a clear conscience. Honesty leads to unbroken fellowship with God. That ought to be number one on the list, by the way. Amen? The Bible says, if you want to worship me, you worship me in spirit and in truth. truth. You gotta get real with God. You can't even get saved till you get real with God. Get real with God. Honesty also protects you from shame. I've sat with too many kids walking in shame because they just didn't choose to live by the right standards. Honesty provides a sense of accomplishment. And every kid needs to have a sense that their life means something, they're accomplishing something, and honesty is one of those highest and most noble goals that you can get. Honesty protects from the cycle of deceit. Because when you choose to live a deceitful life, you continue. And it's one thing after another, and you get more blind 
more blind, more deaf to the truth, and you continue to live in, in this cycle of deceit that becomes a lifestyle. Honesty builds a good reputation of integrity. I said this morning, you know, there's certain people who have a great reputation of integrity. I brought up Terry Acker, for instance. I said, you know, I could take every red cent I own and cash in every bit of money I have, and I could put it in Terry's truck, and it'd be safe. He wouldn't spend it. He'd watch over it. He wouldn't, be, he wouldn't take a dime of it. He wouldn't say, oh, I'm watching this. I'll take a few bucks to cover my cost. He wouldn't rationalize taking it. He wouldn't justify because he's a man of integrity. He has character. He has, he's an honest person. Isn't that what you want said about your own life? So if you want a good reputation, work on the good character. See what pours out of that. Honesty protects you from ruined relationships. What's wrong with so many marriages today? Because there's so little honesty in those marriages. And if you, you know, if you really want to have something successful, the Bible says good names rather, good characters rather, to be chosen than great riches. So it protects you from ruined relationships. And the last one is this. Honesty provides for trusting relationships. Relationships with people you can trust. Relationships with people you know are reliable. Great words. You know, Paul, Paul says, you know, you know what's required of stewards? You know what God wants from us? That we be faithful. What a great word for character. What a great word for integrity. Consistently, righteously bearing the standards of submission to authority, of having a, a heart that learns how to, to, to be honor, honor others and honor God and honor other people's things and respect people's stuff, all right? And also this issue of honesty, that we have a heart that's right with God. Let me just say a quick word to any of you that are still living at home that are young children or teenagers. In your life, you have this power that God's put in your hands to make your life really mean something. One, your youth right now. You're going to look back on it one day. It's going to be one of two things. It's going to be a wonderful experience to be remembered, or it's going to be mayhem. I was not happy. I messed up. I chose to rebel. I didn't listen to my parents. I did what I wanted to do. I did what everybody else. I thought it was more important to be popular than to be honorable. I thought it was more important to be liked by my peers than to be have character. It can be that way. It can be something that can be a delight to remember. And with that, it can be a wonderful experience that can be duplicated in your home in the future if you're willing to make that decision to be the person of honor and to be the person of character. You do remember what the Scripture says. You reap what you sow. All right? So if I sow the right things, then I will reap the right things. The Bible said if you sow to the flesh, you know the flesh, you're going to reap destruction. Choose your will, choose your way, choose what you want, it's destruction. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will of the Spirit reap life, and that eternal life. God says, I have life for you. I think of the great things we have to focus on with our children is a return to character. And there can be no character without a standard. Let me go back to that. A standard that we embrace and a standard that we hold on to. I saw this little sign out there not too long ago. It said, no God, no character. And then underneath it says, no God, no character. K-N-O-W. If you remove the standard of righteousness, that eternal high standard God's given us, His Word, His Son, all right, you move those out of the way and they don't become predominant and primary and important in your life, then you've removed the standard. You, you, you've messed up completely. But if you bring in God to the situation and you embrace Him and you embrace His truth and you embrace these things for your family and for your spouse and for your children and begin to stand on those and live those and teach those, it's amazing what God will do. I know that growing up, my mother embraced a principle which I didn't see till later on in my life. And the scripture puts it this way. It says, train up a child and wait you to go on part. And then another passage went on to say this. You teach them while you are in the way with them. It's good to have devotions. All right? It's good to have a time when you sit down with your Bible and open up to your kids and, you know, you try to encourage them and speak to them from the truth. But the greatest lessons are really not going to be in those devotion times. The greatest lessons are going to be while you're driving to school or while you're going to work or while you're going on vacation or while you're sitting at the dinner table. The greatest lesson will be those things when you're, when, you're, when you're walking down the street and you point something out or you're at the mall together and you can point something out and you can build a life principle and make an important message and make an important point. It's, it's constant forum. Life is a constant forum. The way, he says, while you're in the way, you teach them. So it's everywhere you go, every time you go. But I do believe there's, yes, you need to sit down with them and you need to give them instruction in the Word of God. One of the best things I'd ever did with my children was to take a spiral notebook and put some tabs on it. And we started the tabs just as blank tabs. And we opened up to Proverbs. So we're going to read the book of Proverbs, all right? And we did this not just once, many times. And we're going to look through and we're going to do some character studies in the book of Proverbs. And whatever it talks about, you know, we're going to make a tab for it. If it's talking about wisdom, we're talking about wisdom. If it's talking about a drunk, we're going to talk about a drunk. 
and we're going to have these tabs. So we, we're reading along, and it says something about the fool. We'd go over to our little notebook tab, open up fool, and what is a fool? We'd write down the description of fool that verse had to say. So whenever we're reading Proverbs, get out the topical book and just go through and make some notes about the fool or about the drunkard or about the sloth or about whatever it might be or the wise man or the righteous man. We'd make notes. We had tabs for that. And what are you doing? You're teaching character lessons. You're importing, implying how important character is in their life. But it's, it has to be done. You can't expect your kids to get this stuff by osmosis. And so many parents are. They're neutral. The Bible doesn't say, remember, it doesn't say raise children. It says train children. You raise peas and carrots and watermelons. All right. You train soldiers and marines and sailors. They're trained, all right? So there's a difference between those two words. And as you teach them, you let them know that, hey, these are all for the glory of God in your life. These standards are not fence posts that limit us. They're signposts that point us the way to freedom. This is where you'll find victory. This is where you'll find abundance. This is where you'll find life. This is where you'll find grace. So let's follow the signpost. We're not acting in some legalistic form. We're just acting in a righteous discerning form. It says, oh, simply put, cross that line. You don't want to go there. Stay on this side. This is where the, this is where the pastures are really greenest. This is where the, the life is really the fullest. Let's enjoy that. I would say as I close this message today, you may have already seen your kids come and go through your household. And hopefully you're seeing many of those principles that you instilled in their life being carried out in their life. They may not be where you have for them to be in your own heart and mind, but hey, time is still ticking. God is still moving. God still answers prayer. And they may be far away from God, and we'll talk about that more next Sunday, about just the continued attitude of faith and trust and belief, looking not at things that are seen, but looking at things that are unseen. We'll talk about the importance of that in our, in our walk in life. But for you that still have kids at home, grab these opportunities. For you that have grandkids that visit regularly, use these opportunities. Learn what it means to teach them while you're in the way with them. You don't have to stand with a prepared lesson. There's just so many opportunities for instruction in life every step of the way. But in your home, you that have kids there, realize these three important principles we talked about. Realize them, write them down, embrace them about respect for authority and honor and honesty. Start instilling those into hearts and minds. Let them know the parameters. Let them know the guidelines. And let them know the blessings as well as the problems that result when they don't obey. If you're still at home as a young person, learn these principles. Learn them now in your life. They'll open so many doors for you in the future of your life. You'll be the kind of person that people will line up to hire. You'll be the kind of person that will be promoted. You'll be the kind of person that will be blessed because you're just doing the basic things of honor and integrity that the world so lacks in so many different arenas. You'll be the kind of person who learns to show up on time when you have an appointment. You'll be the kind of person who learns to stand in line to help somebody when they're in need, not the person who turns their face and runs away. You'll be the kind of person that people will look to and look up to and regard with value because you're a person of integrity. Would you stand with your heads bowed? As with every Sunday, we take the opportunity to give an invitation here. First and foremost, the invitation that we give...